いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、いいかへさ、And he's done a lot of good work on this aspect. But recently, he's been doing some very, very interesting work on basically solar dynamos and basically rotation p r o b l e m s in the sun. And he's been talking about some of this work today. Thank you. So, uh, Phil says it's true. I've recently I've gotten interested in、uh, not just how disks go around, but how stars go around. And、uh, I like being sort of an outsider in a field because if you get it right, that looks really you know, neat. It's kind of, and if you get it wrong, no one takes you too seriously anyway. So I'm sort of I'm enjoying that status at least for the moment, although I've started to work long enough in the field that I'm you know, losing my、uh, outsider status. But what I'm going to talk about today is.、Uh, Basically, how the sun、uh, rotates. Why the rotation pattern, which you see, we'll come back to it. But here's、uh, the basic profile. We're looking at lines of isorotational contours here. And the question is why the sun and presumably other stars behave that way? This is a very interesting problem. Let me try to explain why. It seems funny, but I have to justify now to astronomers why stars are interesting objects to study. It's not cosmology, it's not extrasolar planets, it's just rotation in stars. I think one of the most beautiful astronomical results of the last half century, a time when there have been a lot of beautiful astronomical results, has been the precision determination. Of the interior rotation of the sun. It is a remarkable achievement. We now know more detail how the sun, what its internal dynamics is, much more so than we know about the Earth and than we will probably ever know about the internal rotation of our own planet in the outer the core, even though that's also convective. So here's the way the trick is done.、Uh, a star has a variety of different eigenmodes. I should just say global modes. Let me try and keep the mathematical jargon to a minimum. A variety of different modal responses. Broadly speaking, there are two types of major classes P modes, where the restoring force is pressure, G modes, where the restoring force is gravity. And what people have observed are basically pulsational modes, vibrations of the surface. And by doing a decomposition in spherical harmonics, they, the observers can pinpoint and identify thousands and thousands of different individual modes. It's really quite an achievement. And having some idea of the excitation mechanism and seeing what modes are actually present, you invert the problem and figure out what model of the sun would give rise to the particular pattern of modes that you see in so called inverse problems. So, from a mathematical point of view, the object is. To determine in particular now the solar differential rotation, you look at the difference between the frequencies, two different types of modes. Don't worry about all the indices here for the moment. You don't need them for what I want to say here. But you look at non axisymmetric modes. And theory tells you that they are represented by an integral of this form over omega, that's the angular velocity. R and theta here, the normal 
usual spherical coordinates. And this thing KNLM is actually a known function, which depends upon the state of the interior of the star. And the KNLM itself does not depend upon omega, at least to the order we need to work at. And so the problem is to get omega outside of the integral on um, you know, its own side of the equation. That's the inversion problem. And if you have enough of these frequency splittings, basically the way this is often demonstrated, uh, one of the great men of the field, Douglas Goff, likes to demonstrate this by hitting a bell. And that excites a mode on the surface. And it, it's a non-axisymmetric mode, and depending upon whether he, rot he rotates the bell in one direction or the other direction, you can hear the difference in the acoustic excitation of the air. And so that's kind of an analog of what's being done here by looking at the frequency splittings between two different types of modes. That enables you to determine what omega is. Okay, I won't say anything more about the problems of the so-called helioseismology how you do this remarkable inversion problem so accurately. Let me just cut to the chase and tell you what the basic findings are. Because there, the physics of this is quite interesting. The only place in the sun, presumably other stars as well, where there is significant differential rotation is in the convective zone. The radiative interior, to an excellent approximation, rotating uniformly. The convective zone is the only place where you see any differential rotation. This, of course, is, by definition, the only place where there is a significant level of turbulence. And I mentioned this for many years. One of the models people like to use of, in, in accretion disks was one in which the so-called enhanced viscosity was due to convective processes. Well, that's kind of an embarrassment for those models because if you do that, you better put it in with a minus sign because it creates differential rotation rather than damps it. Interesting result. The angular rotation is, roughly speaking, constant on cones of constant theta. This, at mid-latitudes, more cylindrical near the equator more spherical, apparently near the pole. I say apparently, there's some discussion as to how good the data are near the poles. So the question is why? Why does this pattern emerge? So here's what the actual data looks like, circa 2009. And what we're looking at here are contours of constant angular velocity. The sun rotates more rapidly near the poles than at the equator, and the pattern it's remarkably regular throughout the bulk of the convective zone. But you can easily see by eye there are kind of three major divisions. Ah, before I get to those, note that in the, um, you know, the, in the bulk of the convective zone, which is what we're looking at here, there's this ensemble, it's very striking in parallel lines. So what I said wasn't quite true. It's not as though these are all on kind of openings of constant theta, which would give a more kind of fan shape. But these are lines that have been displaced parallel to one another over a very broad equatorial range. The challenge is to explain where that has come from. Now, there are, in fact, three major regions. There is this so-called taco climb, where you have gradients in omega in the interface between the convective zone and the radiative interior, which is rotating uniformly. And there is the surface, you'll notice there is the near surface boundary layer here, where the contours, how shall I say, they develop, it looks like these pennants, these little flags that get longer and longer approach the equator. So there's different dynamics, obviously, in the boundary layers than there is in the interior. We sort of have three different problems, or one problem with 
two different boundary layers that need to be addressed. And the talk today, given the time that it's, I'm going to talk mostly about the basic pattern of these, these parallel lines that you see in the bulk of the convective zone. I'll have a little bit to say about the packet line and very little to say about the surface boundary there. So here's the problem we formulated mathematically. The convective zone is very nearly adiabatic. If it were exactly adiabatic, P would be a function of rho only. That's a barotropic equation of state. And the dynamics of a barotropic equation of state, where P is a function of rho only, are very restricted, as I'll come through below. The convective motions themselves, except very near the surface, where they can approach sonic velocities, are typically very small, 30 to 50 meters per second. Near the pack line, they're just a few meters per second slower than an Olympic racer can run. They outrun the convective motion. Well, likely. But an Olympic gold medalist could. Or even a high school athlete. Now, a barotropic fluid, P is a function of rho, in hydrostatic equilibrium, must rotate on cylinders. I'm going to give you a proof of that. It's actually often mangled in textbooks, where it's presented much more in a much more complicated way. So you remember this proof you were, remember in high school you may have learned this one word proof of the Pythagorean theorem. Behold, and what was his name? Baksara, somebody showed you a little square in that proof. So this is the, this is my one word proof of this, I think it was von Zeichel's theorem, I think it's called. So this is a, my one, Word proof involves just writing down the equation of motion and nothing else. So there's the centrifugal force, or the centripetal force, I should say, the B squared over R. This capital R is cylindrical radius. Grad phi is the gravitational potential, and then the pressure force minus 1 over rho grad P. Now, if P is a function only of rho, then this term is, of course, a gradient, and that term is a gradient. So the right-hand side is an exact gradient. Well, on the left side, I have something which has a component only in the radial direction. Well, that means the right side can depend only on capital R. Depending on something else, it would be components in another direction. But that's an equation. So if the right side depends only on capital R, then the left side can depend only on capital R. End of story. Omega has to be a function only of radius. And of course, the solar rotation profile is decidedly not constant on cylinders, as you saw easily by eye. So the orthodox view on this problem, I think, would go something like this. That despite the simple regularity of the rotation pattern, it really is very complicated because it involves turbulence and a complex interplay processes, convective turbulence, and rotation. The departures from barotropic structure, that is to say, rotation on cylinders, arise because Coriolis forces affect the convection. That's part of this orthodox view. Now, I would disagree with this, but this, I think, is almost certainly correct. That is to say, convection proceeds more easily along the axis of rotation where there are no Coriolis forces, then at right angles to the axis of rotation, where it is deflected by Coriolis motions. Therefore, convection along the axis, what well, so I just said, is more efficient uh, than it is in perpendicular planes, planes perpendicular to the axis, which means poles should be a little hotter, equator should be a little bit cooler. How much? Not very much. We're talking about something that's part of 10 to the 5, something like this. So we expect a very small latitudinal entropy gradient. This is the only equation I'm going to use in the analysis. This is the vorticity equation. I hope that everyone here has 
some point has had a course where that equation has produced, and it is simply the curl of the equation of motion. And I'm going to take only the phi component, the azimuthal component of this vorticity equation, work with nothing else. So it's the curl of V cross omega, omega itself is the curl of V, radiant of pressure, cross the gradient of rho, and divided by rho squared. You see immediately on the right hand side that the case where P is a function only of rho is in fact special, special case, given you a zero. And it is related to the result we just found, we'll see in a moment, but in that case omega is a function only of R. I will work both with cylindrical coordinates, capital R is the distance from the rotation axis, I Z, my the usual spherical coordinates. So, let me excuse a little bit of technical manipulation. If you'd like to follow this, I'll quickly go through the details. If not, you can kind of snooze off, and I'll wake you up when I get to the bottom line. But if I write this equation, and remember, I should take only the phi component, and on the left side, this curl of the V cross, curl, all that stuff actually, for pure rotation, simplifies rather nicely. It depends only on the Z gradient of the angular velocity squared. R is, once again, cylindrical radius. And then on the right side, I'm going to do the following manipulations. I have grab V cross grab rho. I put one of the rows in with the gradient of rho, making that a log. Keep one of the one of the row outside here. And then I insert by hand this inside the log, this power of the pressure, p to the minus 1 over gamma, gamma's the adiabatic index. Now why do I do that? Well, I do that because I want to get an entropy gradient here. I want to work with entropy in the convective zone. And you'll see why in a moment. So gamma is the adiabatic index. The grad p and then 1 over rho, that is to a very good approximation, simply equation of the gradient of the potential gravitational field. And that means this is an er cross this gradient. I take the minus 1 over gamma out. I wind up with this equation. And finally, that whole equation is, there's the left side involving only the z gradient of omega. And then on the right side with sigma, my entropy variable, I have only a theta gradient here. Now, that's kind of remarkable, and I should point out why. If I didn't work with the entropy gradients, I'd have a very difficult dicey problem here. Because this would be a p dr d rho d theta, and then minus a d rho d r d p d theta. And those theta gradients of pressure and the density depend upon perhaps centrifugal distortion, not so easy to evaluate. I multiply them together by a radial gradient, and then I subtract the two. And that's a difficult procedure, because even to first order, I'm taking two numbers which are kind of big and trying to get a small residual. That's a very tricky mathematical procedure. If I work with this entropy gradient, then life is much easier because for the entropy gradient, that radial gradient in a convective zone is nearly zero anyway. There's not much difference between the radial gradient of the entropy and the theta gradient of the entropy. No reason to think that there's going to be a big difference. So there's only one term that dominates in that case, and that is dp dr times ds d theta, the term which is dp d theta times ds dr is doubly tiny, quadratically tiny. So that's why it's good to work with the entropy when you're in a convective zone. So what does this say? This says 
clearly, explicitly now, large-scale latitudinal entropy gradients, that is the right side, due to Coriolis forces, are intimately related to departures from these cylindrical isotopes, the isorotation properties. The basic trend is that moving towards the pole, sigma increases while omega decreases. And that is correct. Omega is, in fact, somewhat larger at the equator than it is at the poles. That's a noticeable effect, 25% effect. The problem now with our task of kind of trying to extract a solution is I have one equation and I have two unknowns. How do I relate sigma to omega? It's not particularly obvious. So when you don't know what you're doing, you have to kind of think heuristically. So here are some heuristics. That's real data. These are the isorotation contours. Now, in the bulk of the convective zone, there's a typical gradient. You know, you notice that that's dominated by the theta component. There isn't much of an R component. Can we say anything about sigma? Well, we don't know much about the gradients of sigma. They've been eliminated by the convective process. There's mixing length theory, which might be able to tell us something about the R gradient. How do we relate these two? Well, here's one important point, a simple mathematical point that is going to be absolutely the crux of the ideas that I'm going to talk about today. That is to say, the entropy appears only in the form of a theta gradient. That means the radial R gradients of sigma are totally unimportant for establishing the omega profile. In other words, from a mathematical point of view, let's define another function, sigma prime, which is the old sigma, basically the old entropy, minus some arbitrary function, but a function only of spherical radius. Well, this sigma prime function, is, this is just as good an equation as the original one. This is kind of a mathematical trivial point, I know. But this sigma prime function is going to play a very important role. It's the key, actually, to unlocking, I think, what is going on in the sun. So, mathematically trivial point, physically very, very important point, as we'll see. Now, think of it this way. Supposing that sigma was, in fact, dominated by an R gradient, which wouldn't be too surprising when I say dominated, a factor of 10 or so. It wouldn't be surprising for the solar entropy profile. The sun is pretty convective. Well, if that's the case, then you choose your sigma r, this other arbitrary function of radius, and just subtract that dominant gradient off. You see, I can then mess around a little bit with the sigma gradient in this way by adding and subtracting a function of r. And I can boost the relative, important of the relative importance of the angular gradient relative to the radial gradient this way. I have that freedom. So that motivates the following kind of thought experiment. This is hardly a proof. But what I want to do is be sloppy. Use this to motivate an approach. And then if the approach works, go back and figure out the right way to do it. We can conceivably tune the gradient of the sigma prime function if we want to be counter-aligned with omega squared by an appropriate choice of sigma of r. Let's, let's assume we can do that. Why would we want to do something like that? Ah, see, this would be very interesting 
if we could actually do that, omega and sigma prime would then share isosurfaces in common. Radiants would be in opposite direction. Surfaces would be the same. Sigma prime would be a function of omega squared. We don't know what f is. It would just be some function. And if, in fact, sigma prime is some function of omega squared, TWE, that's the thermal wind equation. That's the name of the equation that I've been using. It's actually well known in geophysics applications. The thermal wind equation characteristics would define the isorotational surfaces. What I mean by that is you stick in a sigma prime here as a function of omega squared, and I get one differential equation now for one unknown, omega squared. Now, this function is an unknown function, so you think I'm not getting anywhere. But in fact, this would be enormously beneficial. Here's why. Here's my full equation, written now self-consistently in spherical coordinates. F prime is d sigma d omega squared, or d sigma prime d omega squared. And it is itself a function of omega squared. But to solve an equation like this, you notice the form of this type of partial differential equation. I'm going to actually solve this partial differential equation analytically. You don't see that done very often. But right in front of your eyes, you will see the very solution. You see, this is like a Lagrangian derivative. This is kind of like a d by dt <coughs> plus a velocity times a d by dx. I just get, give it different names. So what this is really saying in words is that omega squared is a constant. It has a 0 over here. Omega squared is constant along a path where d theta dr has this form. That's what this equation is saying mathematically. So that, that's by saying what the equation, when you say the words, you kind of said the solution. Omega squared is a constant along d theta dr. Well, so I find out what d theta the solution to this equation is. And omega squared is a constant. That, this equation then defines what I'm looking for. That's the isorotation contour. Well, but f prime, that depends on omega. Ah, huh? depends on omega, but omega is a constant along that curve. So f prime is just some constant. So the solution to that equation is done, but I just have a constant to be determined. The nice thing is that you can manipulate this kind of nasty looking equation at first into a first order linear equation and write down the solution immediately. The solution is r squared sine squared theta, which is just cylindrical r, is equal to a, that's an honest to goodness integration constant, minus b over r, and b is the thing that is proportional to f prime. Along each of these characteristics, as they're called, or along each isorotation contour, b is the same constant. It can vary from one contour to another, but this is an incredibly simple equation. There it is explicitly. Does it make sense? The basic result is clear, right? When capital R is small, when you're near the rotation axis, the dominant balance is this balancing this. A is equal to B over R. In other words, the contour should be spherical when you're near the axis. When you're far away, when R is relatively big, the dominant balance is this against this. The contour should look more cylindrical. And that occurs when you're at the equator. And indeed, the contours did look more similar. So this has the right feel to it. To solve explicitly, we have to know what omega is on the surface, or some surface inside the sun. 
practical matter, imagine you know what it is on the surface. So omega is then a function of, let's say, sine squared theta naught. Presumably it depends symmetrically, it doesn't depend upon plus or minus signs, but it doesn't depend upon plus or minus uh, overall signs in the trigonometric function. Theta zero is the angle along the surface. And so under those conditions, this is the explicit form of the contour, B unknown, and then you can write this in a dimensionless way on B beta. This is basically B over R solar cube, the number of order unit. And that's what each contour has to be in this form. The beta in principle could vary from one to the other. You can see that if beta is the same number throughout the whole sun, it already works pretty well. We'll see that in a moment. But that's it. All those contours, there's the solution. How does it work? Oh, I simply point out here, there isn't anything special about the one over r potential. This one over r actually turns out to be the potential function. So more generally, it's of the form a plus b phi of r. So you can do this if you have a fully convective star, in which case you can determine the phi in terms of the ending functions. But that's as may be. Let me get back to the sun. Here's a casual fit. Once I have this, I just sort of played around. My beta, which I chose to vary smoothly from one contour to the other, I chose to have this form. And that's already, if you just look at the region between the black solid lines, that's already kind of looking vaguely solar-like. Notice that the parallel line motif emerges in these very simple solutions. These are parallel lines already appearing, which is what we found in the data. It's simply, simply a mathematical consequence, a mathematical it's part of the mathematical structure of these uh, curves. And here, I've actually had the courage to lay this right on top of the data. So it doesn't do so great near the poles. It doesn't do particularly well near the equator, but in the bulk. It does it surprisingly well. So it doesn't work in the tackle line. Forget that. It doesn't work in the near surface outer layers. But in the bulk of the convective zone, it's already looking promising. What happens with the, um, at, at R to the point 0.45 wherever the solution ends? Why does it end there? I'm sorry? So your, your characteristics all uh, never cross this uh, surface around R 0.45 or something. Yeah. Well, it has in a boundary, it. In a boundary, like, well, yeah, but that, that's a, that's simply a uh, that's that's anything below the tactic line shouldn't be believed. I used I used the one over r potential. If I used the actual solution, sort of, which was instead of one over r, phi of r, they'd be perfectly well behaved. That's just a mathematical artifact. This in particular has nothing. This structure here is not related to the tactic line. Look similar. Not even so. Nothing to do with it. Just so you can extend this to a fully convective object. You can extend it to a fully convective, but then you wouldn't use a one over R potential. You'd use a, the actual gravitational potential from the solution of the equation. So, yeah, you shouldn't pay attention to this below 0.7. The one over R potential happens to be a good approximation for the convective zone, but then it becomes quickly untenable. Technically, an assumption here of constant depth is a bond over that all yeah. mass in the center. It's effectively a constant that the, uh, yeah. Well, I would say that the convective zone itself is has no mass. It's a test particles, yeah. So, so somehow when you solve this differential equation, you don't need to insert any, insert any boundary condition whatsoever. I don't need to do what? Boundary condition. Well, there is a boundary. There's actually solved for omega. Well, you said I would have to, But the shape of the curve. There is essentially no boundary condition. Right, the top you put in this uh, profile. Right, it but that just gives it just gives the contour a name. Like I right. call this 325 sure. nanohertz, and then I give it a different name. Sure, but somehow the lower boundary doesn't meet any boundary condition. Uh, 
the law of nothing is to be believed down here. There's, some, there's nothing. There's nothing that happened. This, these solutions break down as soon as the Catholic mind appears. And I have stresses which I've neglected. Yeah. Right. So somehow, in the way you assume your equations, there you also eliminate the need to pose bound conditions. I would disagree with that as statement as a general precept. The form of the isorotation contours depends only on geometrical boundary conditions. That is to say, I need to put in what value of R I'm starting at and what value of theta I'm starting at. That's a boundary condition. Now, the less trivial boundary condition of what omega is on the surface, then you're right in the sense that the shape of the, of the isorotation curve does not depend upon what omega is. That's just the name that I call that characteristic. That's the power of this approach. It finesses a lot of, how shall I say, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a powerful constraint. If, if this whole idea is right, I have to give you more justification than what I've given you so far. Uh, oh, yeah, what about if we mess around with the gradients of sigma prime? We'll have to do better than that. But ultimately, I think the mathematics of this is correct. And the rest of the talk, I'll try to build it up with some more powerful physical arguments. But where it leads us is with an understanding that the shape of these curves is something that the turbulence theory has no choice but to satisfy. It's a little like whatever quantum mechanics tells you when it matters in thermal equilibrium, it has to have a Planck spectrum, whatever the Einstein A and B are. It's not the same A and B, right? It's not the same A and B, I wish. Yeah. <laughs> I think the theory is probably slightly less important than, you know, I don't mean to be pompous with this, but I'm trying to, <laughs> to give you a sort of a physical idea of what this means. I think it's an overall constraint. There's still room for people to tell me what exact, why does the surface of, o, of the sun have a particular value it does? What I'm saying is that when you look at the surface profile, we now have a way to understand why the contours may not be just constant on cylinders. For example, if you do pose a boundary condition at the technocon, and not insisting sigma and omega squared have the same... Dependence. Well, you see there's actually a good reason why that relationship might hold even in the technocon. I see. I'll come to that. Okay. Yeah. I, haven't just, I haven't justified it yet, but... I hope I can get through and show you why that might work. All right, can we do better? Yes, we can. <coughs> well, here's a bit that uh, my student did for me, Julius Bonnach. This is data now. This is the so-called gong data, which was uh, Earth-based surveillance of the solar modes, based on that. And here is the analytic fit that he gave using, now in this value, in this one, this beta parameter changes, but very smoothly. There's only two parameters here rather than one. And you can see in the bulk of the convective zone, there really is not a contour that is not adequately fitted, including some rather subtle changes in the curvature here. So I thought that was remarkable. Question is, so those globally fit rather than fit on a particular surface of the configuration or a particular wave uh, radius? Yes, those were globally fit. Oh, no, 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 I see what you're saying. No. He started at an interior point, one, at one value of the radius. Mm -hmm. And the soul, and then he basically then fit the slope. But he didn't fit the slope for every single contour, he had basically a function theta, which had two parameters. And he chose those two parameters and, he got, and then the whole sun fell out of that. But it was chosen, the fitting was done at a single point. And clearly it was not a point of uh, radius that was within the... Uh, we stayed away from the boundary there. And this defines implicitly sigma as a function of omega, mm -hmm. 20 bits away. If I, this is, this is essentially implying, once I know, once you fit to the data, then you get this estimate <coughs> that you didn't know before. 
which is a little bit ridiculous. His fit actually does kind of That's right. If you were, if you were to, he did a, a you know, curve fitting, but what it does physically is to give you this dynamical connection between sigma and omega. And in it? fact, that's the interesting thing about this theory. You can imagine using a diagnostic way for exactly that kind of calculation. A lot of questions. Something about this works. Why is it really that this sigma prime, whatever sigma prime is now, and omega, why do they care about each other so much? Can we use this diagnostically? Yes. Can we extend this to fully convective stars? Yes. This can be done. What about the tachyclone? What about the outer layer? First, the most important question is this relationship between sigma prime and omega. First, there have been a lot of numerical studies. What do numerical studies say about this? People, uh, and in particular the Colorado group, have spent decades, literally, developing and refining codes to look at rotation and convection. So, first of all, this is a simulation taken from the work of Mark Nietzsche and others. An old paper now, 2006. This shows just the validity of this so-called thermal wind equation, the balance between the entropy gradient and the omega gradient. It may not balance exactly because we haven't put in the effect of the turbulence on the dynamics. There's a good reason to think that that's in the bulk of the convective zone. That's probably a good approximation. And to the extent that these colors agree with each other, this is a good approximation. So I think that's fairly convincing data that the thermal wind balance is good. And this is very interesting. This I had to extract from Mark via private communication. The way these codes are run, in fact, what they solve for directly is sigma prime. They lay down a fixed radial entropy gradient, which drives the convection. And then the code calculates the deviation from that, if you will so-called residual entropy. And it is this residual entropy which is anti-correlated with the angular velocity. To the extent that these two diagrams show opposite colors, the assumption that sigma prime is a function of omega squared is good. This is the total entropy, which doesn't look anything like either the residual entropy Is that one of the two that we Yep, this is one where they force the latitude and longitude gradient. That's the hard part. We can use this diagnostic. Let me skip over that, because that's a bit technical for now. I keep coming back to the, I keep posing this question and not answering it. Why the sigma prime? Why is it a function of omega squared? What is going on? A sharpening question. What we actually need, because of this freedom to constantly add and subtract a function of r, what we actually need is that the two-dimensional <coughs> residual entropy be an additive function of omega squared and r. So in its most general form, we always have this freedom to add on a function of r. So what I'm saying is that this two-dimensional function, which is a function of r and theta, I can also write, by which, as a function of omega squared in R, use any two variables I want, and when I write it as a function of omega squared in R, it can't be any old function of it. It has to be additive. If that works, the theory works. Now, how might that arise? Answer is so simple, I almost don't want to show it to you. It's a well-posed mathematical asymptotic limit. As I've said, regard the two-dimensional residual entropy as some function of r and theta, which by the implicit function of theorem, or whatever it's called, can be regarded as a function of omega squared in r as well. You can place, locate yourself inside the sun by knowledge of omega squared in radius. Well, 
The nice thing about this formulation is that the range of omega is not very large. There's not a lot of differential rotation. And the range of R is not particularly large. The convective zone is pretty thin. So imagine the mathematical limit where the spread in omega and the spread in R is very small. I'll just take a first order Taylor series expansion of this, and I'm done. Because this is a function of omega squared plus a function of R. There's no getting around it. That's exactly the form that we're seeking. And it's a little bit more restricted because this gives you a beta value and you're not allowed to change it now from one contour to the next. But here's the data and here's the analytic solution with one value of beta. And I haven't I've cheated because I've put in the packet line here. I've put in the outer layer for a different theory. So you should just sort of concentrate on this and this. And you can see that at least qualitatively, even this very, very simple theory, the so-called thin convective layer theory, qualitatively and even semi-quantitatively reproduces the sun rather well. One parameter for the whole sun. What does it mean at the Capricorn? So you can't eat this pie at all? I'll talk about the Capricorn. I can't see it. will spoil my pitch if I can talk about it now. Capricorn is coming up. Now, best fit is not one value of beta for the whole sign, but beta needs to at least vary slowly, which means that this idea that sigma prime is a function of omega squared plus possibly a function of r, that needs to hold a higher order other than just the first term in the Taylor series. So I want to give you a physical model that at least motivates why these two things angular velocity and entropy are related. Point number one, convection mixes entropy within a convective cell. So there's no controversy there. So I pose the question, why is there a radial entropy gradient in steady state in a perfectly spherical star? Convection is being mixed all the time. Well, obviously we require some DSVR to maintain the convection. This is sustained by the radial radiative luminosity driving this unstable entropy profile from below. But with rotation, of course, we have a steady two-dimensional profile. How do we maintain a steady two-dimensional profile if it's this, the radiation doesn't know about Coriolis forces? That's trying to maintain a one-dimensional entropy. The answer is, of course, that at some level it can't. The excess entropy, the fact that any difference between what the perfectly spherical star would give and what the actual entropy is, that is well mixed within a convective cell. You can't get around it. That is to say, it is a constant. This S prime should be a constant within a convective cell. But that constant may be different at the equator than at the pole. Good that. But certainly, if it can be mixed, it will be mixed. You don't need any more entropy gradient to maintain the convection other than S of R. So you're saying that the conditioning connected cells to be mostly radial, that's at a given cell? Well, and and the fact that the, the data mostly show, I think that, that has been a mystery as to why Omega should be, the surfaces of constant omega should be nearly radial. And in fact, I think it's related because it's so intimately linked to the convective process, which is indeed nearly radial. Convective cells live in and make constant sigma prime surfaces. But convective cells, especially big, coherent, long-lived structures, the ones that do most of the transport, are affected by shear. They are sheared into, and they tend to live in, surfaces of constant omega. If they didn't live in surfaces of constant omega, they would be sheared into it. If they do live in a surface of constant omega, then they're in a surface of constant omega. You can even prove this mathematically simply by mass conservation. And those of you who have worked with accretion disks or are familiar with kind of a 
Goldreich and Linden Bell calculation from the 60s, where they introduced this idea of an embedded disturbance having a wave number which shears with time, if you actually go through the arithmetic, then in fact, you find that in fact, the surfaces of mass flux are, how shall I say, perpendicular to the gradient of omega. So in fact, this is a, uh, this is a mathematical derivation of what I think is a fairly simple idea to envision that as I have shear, that if I have a mass flux going on within that surface, the mass flux will tend to occupy surfaces of constant omega, sheared into those surfaces. Follows simply from kinematics and mass conservation. But if the convective rolls live in surfaces of constant sigma prime and they live in surfaces of constant omega, they're the same surfaces. <coughs> so here's kind of a picture of this, a convective roll, a surface of constant omega, and this is where the convective roll will live happily since it's not disrupted by the shearing process if the dynamics allows it to. So here's a summary of what I've said. Entropy is most efficiently mixed in surfaces in which convective shells, cells are not sheared. Right? Just leave them alone to mix the entropy. That is the most efficient way to mix the entropy in constant angular velocity sheets. That statement, I think, is not terribly surprising. But the mathematical implementation of this is actually a very powerful analytic tool. The form of the isorotation contours can be then determined without a detailed knowledge of the convective turbulence. Convective turbulence then serves essentially tell us what boundary conditions we should use for precise implementation of the mathematical form of these curves. What about the packet line? The way we, you're interested in the packet line. What's special about 54.7 degrees? That, that Nobody answers this question correctly, but I kind of <laughs> no, the is just for herself. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so 54.7 degrees in the sun itself occurs right kind of at the zero point. It always reminds me of these diagrams of the optic nerve of the eye. That's where the everything goes this way and that way. Right at 54.7 degrees. Right up to the extent that you can measure. What does that scream at you? What does that tell you? Something incredibly obvious. Homer is chuckling in the back. He's heard me go on about this before. So. That's the zero of P2 cosine theta. The path of Klein is a whopping big quadrupole staring you in the face. This is a clue. So what we have done in the bulk of the convective zone is to take this equation, and as I said, I can think of it as kind of a Lagrangian derivative. We use r as the Lagrangian variable instead of time, along a particular path. The path itself is just the isorotation contours. Theta is a function of r. And let me call this derivative, this script d over script dr. I'll just read this d over dr. Then the solar convective zone, what we've been talking about thus far, is d dr of omega squared is zero. <coughs> the tackle line and the outer layer, which I won't be able to talk about today, have the form d dr of omega squared is something else. All the other stuff in the equation that I've left out is due to all the rest. Now, you might think that all the rest is extremely complicated. That would be the orthodox view. Well, the tackle line and the outer layer are, in fact, both very thin. The 
makes sense to treat them in the mathematical sense as boundary layers with r equals a constant. The outer layer needs a little bit of help. As I say, I won't have time to talk about that today. But the tachypon, we can just view this with r being fixed and a function only of theta. Well, if it's a function of only theta, I think I know what that function is. It's P2 cosine theta. The question is, from a mathematical point of view, how does this work? What kind of solution for the tachypon do you get? Ah, this is just some of the technical detail of how to solve that equation, which we don't need to spend time on here. Here is the actual GAN data. And here is the solution that Henrik Lather and I worked on. And you can see, even to the point of having these little needs, the match of the details, not just the location of the, of the divergence of the, of the contours, but the details themselves worked out surprisingly well. Here is an overlay. The red is the data. The black is a solution for the solar convective zone together with a P2 solution for the tachypon. Here, I've actually gone through and uh, overlaid a more recent match. The red is the data. Black is the GON. Sorry, the black is the GON data. The model is red. And I think the match is very good. And there isn't really a major feature that isn't accounted for in this incredibly simple model. Is this equivalent still to the constant theta, or you allow yourself to that? Theta changes slowly from poles to equator. So it's not it's not uh, exactly a constant. The other one where you have complete freedom and theta look even better in the convection zone. That's uh, well, that's right. Well, also it's a little bit different here because. Uh, the data are plotted in equal intervals of delta omega, where is, whereas the model is plotted in intervals of delta theta. Oh, okay. So a little bit shapes. offset. Occasionally it shifts. Whereas the first model that my student did, who's much more confident at this than I am, in both cases he was plotting delta. So let me summarize where we stand. This is what I call sort of the royal road. Now, I presented this talk as though I just sat down at my desk in 15 minutes and put this all together. I can assure you there were a number of blind alleys before this started to fall into place. But I'll call this the royal road. This is the way I would like to have done the problem. And I'll share it with you because I think it's actually a very good summary of the results themselves. First thing, you look at the numerics and you can say, oh my goodness, this thermal wind balance is an excellent approximation. That's the equation we should be working with and it's supported by at least some of the numerical simulations. At least the numerical simulations that look like the sun have a good match with the thermal wind balance assumption. There are heuristic arguments that suggest that I should play around with the entropy function, work with a residual entropy, with a residual entropy function that has a function of R subtracted off from it because it's a way of aligning the omega and the entropy gradients. And if I can get them counter-aligned, then I can make mathematical progress with the equation. So it's worth looking at particular class of solutions. Sigma prime is a function of omega squared. Mathematically speaking, I'm on, firm, I'm on firm ground. Because if I regard that entropy, that residual entropy, as a function not of r and theta, but omega squared in r, and I do a Taylor expansion, I get precisely this form. 
plus a function of r over here, which I can absorb into O sigma uh, prime. So I'm on, I'm on firm mathematical grounds with that assumption as well, at least in one limit. Another reason. There's a physical argument. Convective cells tend to be in constant omega cells just because of, for kinematical reasons, and because entropy is as well mixed as it can be. Another reason to argue or to look for solutions in which sigma prime is a function of omega squared. Numerical simulations actually show this to be a reasonable approximation. Yet another reason to look for solutions in the solar convective zone with residual entropy. That's the tricky part, not entropy. It's residual entropy using this gauge freedom to add and subtract a function of R to look for that as a function of omega squared. Finally, if I actually use this in the thermal wind equation, the solution that emerges is mathematically very, very tractable. It's very, very simple. And finally, the agreement with observations, I think you'll agree, is pretty striking. Three sentence summary. Solar convective zone is in fact, people have argued back and forth on this. I think there's no question. It's a thermal wind balance from near the surface, not at the surface, and down to about 0.77 solar radii, at which point the path of line dynamics comes in. Below this radius, there is forcing the uniform rotation, which is approximately local. In other words, the R, the change in R is not important to the dynamics. And the quadrupolar structure in theta is very, very apparent. And then point number three, one I have not had time to talk about today, but the same game can be played in the outer layers with reasonably good agreement as well. The difference is I think I can say something about why it is quadrupolar in the path of crime, and I'm still not sure precisely what is going on in the outer layers. I think in the path of crime, those are most likely to be magnetic quadrupolar stresses. That would be my guess at this point. So why should we care about this? One, at the level of fluid dynamics, it's a very interesting problem. In principle, if this is all holds together, then the theory offers some powerful diagnostics uh, of, how should I say, diagnostics of the entropy gradient in a convective medium. Uh, the tracking down what the, those entropy gradients are observationally is a very difficult problem because they're so small. But here, we can relate them to the rotational dynamics, so we have a handle on that. So that's potentially very interesting. People who do dynamo theory uh, would love to have simple analytic forms for omega as a function of r and theta, uh, particularly one that is grounded in rotational dynamics. And that just drops out of this work. MF, the mean field turbulence theory. There's a, another approach to this subject which confronts the turbulence more directly and models it the same way that people model turbulence accretion disks, traditionally using an alpha parameter. So mean field theory does the same thing. It's basically mixing length theory, modeling the turbulence phenomenologically. And what's interesting is that this now gives mean field uh, turbulence, mean field theory for turbulence, an interesting goal. And they tell us what this f of omega squared is, this function that relates residual entropy and angular velocity. So that's an interesting theoretical consequence. And then finally, uh, this approach can be extended. I didn't have time to talk about it today. Nigel Weiss and I have worked on fully convective stars. And potentially, uh, it would be quite interesting to see where this might lead uh, to rotation and convection in gas giant planets, the whole area for this And I think, yeah, that's all for 
today. Yeah, exactly. Breaking. That's that's where the flux is breaking. 